My name is Chad Snow. I'm the chairman of Citizens for a Better Arizona. And I'll be right. Right. I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. I especially want to give my personal thanks to our, our distinguished uh, panel of guests. I think they have some interesting comments for us tonight. Um, this is the first in a series of several of these educational informational forums that we plan on holding before the election in November to, to inform people about issues of public safety, fiscal accountability, and abuse of power within the, uh, the county sheriff's office here in Maricopa County. Um, it's very timely. Randy and I were talking. We're having this meeting here tonight against the backdrop of uh, a sworn law enforcement officer, Sheriff Arpaio, who has told the Department of Justice, I'm not going to cooperate with your uh, investigation. So it's a very timely meeting. Uh, I'm interested to hear what our presenters have to say about that. Um, we want to thank uh, our, our main sponsor for this event, the UFCW, uh, Jim McLaughlin. I don't know if Jim is here. Is he here? Uh, and without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator, Julie Murphy. She's the only person from North Dakota I've ever met. <laughs> and she is also, aside from that, she's the creator of Politics on Cuff, which is a political blog that examines uh, pressing public policy issues here in Arizona. Uh, her political commentary has been featured on local, local news shows, KJZZ, uh, the Arizona Republic, Phoenix New Times, Huffington Post. Julie has been an outspoken advocate for practical solutions to some of our most challenging problems. When confronted with the tragic and untimely death of her husband, Phoenix Police Officer Nick Herfley, at the hands of an undocumented immigrant, Julie refused to fan the flames of fear and intolerance by condemning all undocumented immigrants. <laughs> solutions through legislative policies. Julie is a former creative services writer and producer for Phoenix television stations KPHO and KTVK and a summa cum laude graduate in broadcast journalism from Minnesota State University, Moorhead. Uh, Julie is also a member of our newly created advisory board of Citizens for uh, a Better Arizona. So please welcome me and join Julie Earthley, our moderator. <laughs>
In 2008, following numerous raids by Sheriff Arpaio and the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office, Mayor Gordon decided to no longer remain silent. In a letter dated April 4th, 2008, Phil documented in detail Arpaio sweeps through predominantly Latino neighborhoods in Phoenix and Guadalupe. Over the past few weeks, Sheriff Arpaio's actions have infringed on the civil rights of our residents, Phil wrote. They have put our residents' well-being and the well-being of law enforcement officers at risk. Phil said he was moved to write the letter after Arpaio pledged to bring his sweeps to other Valley cities on an ongoing basis. Phil asked the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division and the FBI to probe what he called a pattern and practice of conduct that includes discriminatory harassment, improper stops, searches, and arrests. Phil is the father of four children. Please join me in welcoming Phil Gordon. Well, thank you very much, Julie, and my uh, colleagues up here, but also everyone that's attending and will be watching this. Uh, let me first start out by saying uh, there are many, many people that have fought this battle over the years and, and long before Arizona was involved. I, many of you in the audience uh, have suffered uh, because of the actions of uh, Sheriff Apayo and, and others like Senator Pierce and our former county attorney. I see Mary Rose is here. I see Jim, uh, or Mike Lacey and his partner Jim Larkin. Mike is here reporters, publishers, judges, county attorneys, U.S. attorneys, uh, attorney generals, Republican and Democrats, men, women, children, veterans, citizens, and of course those that have come to this country to not only help us, but help their families. I, I just want to say that uh, the only thing, and I've said this in public before, that I regret is that I didn't stand up sooner. I, I do want to thank, not because they're sitting here, but in particular the three colleagues of mine that are at this table, tables, because they helped me once I stood up to protect me and protect many of the residents and citizens in this great city and state. Because like so many of you in the room and so many in the, in the city and these three, they were targeted just like I was and they paid the price. But they all put the importance of defending the rights that this country was founded on, the bedrock principles ahead of their self-interest. And I mean that from my heart. So first and foremost, Paul, who really did get me and protect me and take me uh, under his arm, but Paul, former U.S. attorney, and who paid a, a dear price for fighting for what is right. Mayor Goddard, Attorney General Goddard, who uh, unfortunately got me involved in running for office. <laughs> <laughs> and who we had coffee with today, Julie, uh, he and I, and I, I started to say, my God, I'm starting to think just like him in terms of his planning <laughs> principles. But Terry, as Attorney General, uh, you stood up and back me and about those principles. And then my dear and close friend, Rick Romley, uh, who was one of the few, I think, only elected officials that was a Republican that stood up and, and took on Sheriff Apayo and, and the county attorney then and, and the hatred. Uh, and like many people in this room and my colleagues, he paid a, a price also. So thank you, my dear friends. Let me say, uh, I was asked to give a little history. First, let me note that today's April 4th, um, as was pointed out to me by Randy, who I must thank also. Um, unfortunately, uh, another great hero in this country, Martin Luther King, was killed on this day, and not to compare the two, but four years ago on this date is when I sent the first letter to the Attorney General and to the administration. While Sheriff Apayo would like us all now to think that this is a political vendetta against them, one orchestrated by the Democrats and by President Obama and myself and others in this room. Let me point out that that letter was sent in April, in April, during a Republican administration, President Bush, and continued on during the Democratic administration. But also let me point out as a 
graduate of government from the University of Arizona, but an ASU graduate of law school. <laughs> and a son that went to NAU, so I covered all bases. <laughs> now, truly, and I believe it, while it's a, a phrase, but justice, since this country was founded, is supposed to be and has been blind. It's not a Republican justice, it's not a Democratic <coughs> justice, it's a justice. And that's what's been going on. It hasn't been a vendetta, but it's been an investigation on civil rights violations, abuse of power, <coughs> and criminal. And what I wanted to state is that uh, those that have been fighting this fight and have suffered and those unsung heroes, those children, and parents, and grandparents, they're the ones that well, I think everyone that had the courage to stand up stood up originally. And now more and more people are standing up. If you look across the country and even in Arizona, the majority of citizens now believe in a comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, those were bad words in the days when a number of us stood up early. But now it's become reality that people understand that you can't send children back to a country they never knew. You can't send veterans back that have fought for this country. And, it's, and this economy has been hurt so bad. There were three elements, three uh, events that uh, really got me to stand up. The first and foremost was my grandmother and grandfather. They came to this country at 13 and 14 with young children alone to escape what we all began to know as the Holocaust. If it wasn't for this country allowing them in, relaxing the immigration policies in those days, then I'm sure I wouldn't be here like the other six million people that perished in the, in the horrors of Nazi Germany. So that, those were the principles that my grandmother and grandfather taught me when I was a little boy. The second one was uh, when I was invited to participate uh, in a meeting at a church, Trinity Church in Sunny Slope by Valley Interfaith. And there I sat around in a room with mothers and fathers and children crying almost the entire time. Mothers who had lost their son, a mother who had lost their son because he came home from school, was stopped by a deputy sheriff, and then arrested and deported. Another son that had lost their mom and dad, his mom and dad, that took a second job, was working in the evenings so that their children could have a better life and they were arrested and deported. So those stories tore at the very threads of what I believed in. And then, let me say the third thing, it was a woman named Jessica. Jessica worked for me as an intern when she was in high school, when I was a council person, and then has stayed with me the entire time I was council mayor. <coughs> she and three other couples were out north at Lake Pleasant four years ago. And admittedly, they went down a road that was posted that it was closed. And they realized their mistake and turned around, except the deputy sheriff stopped them off. The deputy sheriff waved the first three cars on and said leave. The fourth car was Jessica and her husband. Not only were they held, but she was, it was demanded that she produce her driver's license, and her social security card. And after the deputy determined that she was, quote, legally here, then he issued her a citation. Now, Jessica, the only reason that she was stopped and issued that citation, and the only difference between the first three couples was that her last name was Rodriguez in, in Brown. Third generation American, father fought in Vietnam and somebody that works with me. So those three things on the Cesar Chavez luncheon really encouraged me to stand up, even knowing that the retribution would immediately follow, and it did. And again, if it wasn't for my friends up here, and I do want to acknowledge the FBI special agents that worked very hard to protect me and, and my family, as well as the chief of police of Phoenix, Jack Harris, paid a dear price, and Chief Gascon of Mesa paid a dear price. Um, 
we, we fought the battle. And uh, I ask everybody to continue. We all know what's happening now. Um, unfortunately, uh, Sheriff Apio has, has continued to hurt this community in the state economically. There are businesses I've seen firsthand and talked to that haven't come here. There are conventions that not only didn't come here, but conventions that were canceled. Hotels, rooms, businesses, small and large, white, brown, Asian, black owned, all suffering. We lost a lot of money at a time when we needed it in a lot of jobs. We can thank uh, the sheriff for that. You also heard that he was trying to, that he was making this city, this county, and this state safer. Well, let me tell you firsthand from the chiefs of police and officers on the street, those practices that continue today haven't made our city safer. The officers, which is Nick, that gave their lives and made us safer. But going after dishwashers and maids and young children didn't make us safer. It just took resources off the street to go after those violent criminals. And the other thing that most people have never heard is the immigrant community, as well as citizens that were Hispanic, were afraid to point out those criminals that were dealing drugs, smuggling people, and killing and murdering people because of fear of deportation, not just for themselves, but family members and their children. They were afraid to testify in court because of fear of when they left, they would be arrested by the deputies and the sheriff and deported. They were afraid to participate with the Phoenix police that for years the police have built up that trust and confidence to, to go after the criminals because of fear that the police, the sheriffs, <coughs> would arrest them. Children and their parents were afraid to go to school, afraid to go to church on Sundays for fear that the deputies would follow them, and in fact they did. And one of the most outrageous cases that I witnessed was a veteran, Hispanic, origins that fought in Iraq, came back, and was crossing the street in North Phoenix, and was spit upon by individuals and told to go back to his country. This veteran was still active and still wearing his uniform. And lastly, lastly, the pain that, that so many children have suffered, losing their parents, losing their brothers and sisters, a policy that doesn't make sense. Whether you're Democrat or Republican, doesn't matter to me. But I think that President Obama probably said it best. This country that still has the best education system higher in the world brings so many people to this country to get that higher education. And then they go back and, and help their countries with the education they learned here. Here we take the brightest of the bright and we send them away engineering students that are first, second, and third in their class at ASU, high school students at Carl Hayden that competed for over five years in robotic contests against universities as well as high schools in the country and finished first four out of those five years, but couldn't go the sixth year because the competition was held in Canada. So they would have been arrested and not allowed back in this country. These policies don't make sense. They never did, and they need to end. And together, I really do believe we can make a difference, just like when we came together in the 50s and made a difference. It was horrible then that being black and driving resulted in people being arrested. It's just as bad today being brown and driving and being arrested. So with that, again, I thank my colleagues, and I thank you all for being here. And, uh,
In March of 1991, Paul joined the U.S. Attorney's Office as an assistant U.S. Attorney where he prosecuted a wide variety of matters from homicides to complex fraud cases. In November of 2001, President George W. Bush nominated Paul as the U.S. Attorney for the District of Arizona. While in that office, Paul's top priorities for the U.S. Attorney's Office included terrorism, illegal immigration, and public corruption. Paul brought attention to public corruption, greatly increasing the investigations into and prosecutions of those individuals who betrayed the public's trust. Paul served as the United States Attorney for the District of Arizona from 2001 to 2007. Paul has taught many classes in Latin America at the request of the U.S. Department of Justice, providing instruction to Latin American prosecutors and judges in the Spanish language on the American criminal justice system. Paul's current law practice at Gallagher and Kennedy focuses on the representation of public officials, white collar defense, corporate compliance, and Native American law issues. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here this evening. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's always good to be with my friend uh, Rick Romley and Terry Goddard and Phil Gordon. Uh, Phil Gordon is a it is an honor uh, to be present with Julie Irving, who is an individual that's shown extraordinary grace courage, and now leadership through her writings. I thank you for all you're doing for us in the community. We very much appreciate it. There is uh, one other group of individuals that it's very important for me to thank as well. The vast majority of men and women who work within the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office are men and women of good faith. They went to that job because they wanted to contribute to the community. They wanted to do what is right. The Department of Justice has found a systemic problem within the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office, and the responsibility for that problem lies squarely on the shoulders of Joe Arpaio. Oh, May I start all over again? <laughs> <laughs> Just the last line. Just the last line. The responsibility for the systemic problem that the Department of Justice has found lies squarely on the shoulders of Joe Arpaio. But I know for a fact that there are many individuals, men and women within the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office who have refused to comply with the orders, unlawful orders, unethical orders, unconscionable orders that were given to them. To those men and women, I say thank you. They are in service to us, and we should be grateful for that. Remember that we cannot paint that organization with so broad a stroke that we taint all of them with Joe Arpaio's wrong. Abraham Lincoln said years ago that if you want to test an individual's character, give them power. And that's true in our own lives. If you think about your parents when you were young and how they behaved around you, that was a reflection of their character. If you think about your boss today, how she or he treated you, that's a reflection on their character. And it's true for law enforcement as well. We give them an extraordinary amount of we ask them to protect and to serve us, and in exchange, we give them the power of arrest. In the court system, they can remove us from society for a short period of time. They can remove us from society for life. In rare circumstances, we allow them to take another individual's life. That power comes with extraordinary responsibility. And the individuals who supervise those line law enforcement officers, those line deputies, have geometrically greater responsibility to make sure that they comply with the law and with our Constitution. And that responsibility increases as you move up the chain of command within those organizations until you arrive at the highest level. If the test for integrity, for character, is how you deal with power, then Joe Arpaio has failed that test. He has failed that test because the individuals here will tell you he has abused his authority by targeting these individuals, Rick, Terry, and Phil. He has failed that test because, as the Department of Justice pointed out in its study, if you are Latino, you are four to nine times more likely to be pulled over because you are Latino. But we too have failed. 
do not mean we, those individuals here in this room, because you are here, because you have a great sensitivity to this issue, I'm doubting. But we, as a greater society, we as a country have failed. Because we have allowed the issue of illegal immigration to diminish and trivialize the idea and the importance of civil rights. Over 200 years ago, James Madison, one of our more brilliant founding fathers among our universe of brilliant founding fathers, said that in a free country, the security of civil rights is just as important as the security of religious rights. If you change that paradigm for a moment and think differently about the way we live now with Joe Arpaio at the head of the sheriff's office, and you consider what it would be like if people of faith were pulled over four to nine times more often because they were people of faith. How long do you think we as a community would put up with that? Even if you were able to draw some kind of nexus between people of faith and illegal immigration, how long would we as a nation put up with that? It's our fault that we have allowed the dialogue, really the noise, the loud shouting about illegal immigration to take away from the significance and the importance and the value of civil rights. Our founding fathers recognized that it was at an equal level of religious rights. They are both cornerstones to our government. Now I know there's a lot of hand wringing about yesterday's events. Our pilot refusal to accept the monitor from the Department of Justice, the Department of Justice's refusal to continue negotiations with the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office. Joe Arpaio should have accepted the monitor. He should have cooperated with the Department of Justice, but I will tell you, in my opinion, there is a salutary effect to a trial in this matter. It will be good to have a trial in this matter. Let's hear the witnesses testify. Let's hear Terry Goddard take the stand and talk about the false accusations that were brought against him. Let's hear the repercussions that Phil Gordon had to go through after he stood up against Joe Arpaio. Let's hear what happened to Rick Romley as a Republican when he had the courage to take on one of the most popular Republican officials in this county. Let's hear from the hundreds of other individuals whose lives were irrevocably changed after Joe Arpaio targeted them in one fashion or another. Our system of justice is a justice system with many faults, but it is the greatest system of justice in the world. Let this trial go forward. I say we embrace this concept. Let this trial go forward. Let the community see the evidence. Let the state see the evidence. Let the nation understand what's been happening here. Let the world see what we do as a nation when this kind of wrong takes place. Let's let a jury of our peers decide what should happen here. And I think that decision, the Department of Justice's decision, and I hope this is their ultimate decision to try this case, will be the best thing that we will see happen and come out of all of this because it will be, at the end of the day, a learning experience for all of us and a lesson for any others who think that this is the appropriate way to deal with civil rights in this country.
happen and what will actually happen may be two different things. What I hope will happen is that the Department of Justice said we are done negotiating with the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office. We are now at a point where negotiations are fruitless. We've been led down and misled to go down a path that hasn't resulted in a reasonable outcome. Now it's time to present our evidence. What I fear will happen is that they will at some point in time look at the costs. And this is right for them to look at these costs and consider these costs. But they will look at the costs of a trial, the resources that have to go into presenting a trial, and they will attempt to reach an accommodation with the sheriff's office. What ought to happen, and here is where our responsibility comes in, is that we ought to insist that at this point in time, there be a trial. We're done. Terry completed his second term as Arizona's Attorney General in January 2011 and re-entered the private practice of law. During his eight years in office, he focused on protecting consumers and fighting the organized criminal activities of the drug cartels. He made significant progress in attacking cartel money laundering, seizing approximately $20 million, and negotiating an historic $94 million settlement with Western Union in February 2010. He received the Kelly Wyman Award from his fellow attorneys general in July 2010 in recognition of his work fighting border crime and consumer fraud. Terry was elected mayor of Phoenix four times, leading the city from 1983 to 1990. In those years, Phoenix made significant progress in increasing citizen participation in government, expanding and modernizing law enforcement, revitalizing downtown and setting up nationally recognized programs in economic development, the arts, and historic preservation. Terry is an Arizona native and graduate of Harvard College and ASU College of Law. Prior to attending law school, Terry served as an active duty, an active duty tour in the U.S. Navy, retiring as a commander after 27 years in the Naval Reserve. He lives in downtown Phoenix with his wife, Monica, and teenage son. Welcome, Terry. Thank you, Julia. Wow, this is this is the opposite of the, <laughs> the Paul Charlton soft talk. So I'll stand back. But thank you, and, and thank you all, and, and thank you for the convening of this this discussion. I think the thing that I was noticing the most as we have the first two uh, speakers is that this is a quiet discussion. This is a discussion that is in remark remarkable counterpoise to some of the shouting, the chest thumping, and the demonstrations that have accompanied this issue so often, almost to the exclusion of a rational dialogue. And Julia, thank you for being such a leader in making sure that that dialogue is now beginning to be heard. Uh, certainly, if anybody had an opportunity or really a good excuse for being emotional and, and thump thumping, you've had it, and you've gone in exactly the opposite direction and said that the reason and facts are what we need to talk about, and we need to seek justice and not just vengeance. So we have done it. <laughs> I'd like to talk for just a moment about the difference between the kind of symbolic discussions, the kind of debate about symbols and, and that we have seen for so often, and that I think much of what the discussion around the sheriff involves, and, and trying to focus on what's actually happened. And if there's nothing else that comes out of this evening, I hope that's a big part of it. Because there are facts and there are symbols, and we need to talk about facts. Uh, I joined with the former Attorney General of Arizona, Grant Woods, uh, recently, you know, among many statements that were made before the Supreme Court uh, concerning the upcoming argument about Senate Bill 1070. And Grant and I and 42 other former Attorney Generals, who, who by the way signed this little green paper, I have to bring it way around for a moment, um, made what I think is a very important point. Uh, and it's one that has gotten lost in all of the many discussions and much of the rhetoric concerning both the sheriff and 1070. And 
that is that this action was not good law enforcement. In fact, it made our community significantly less safe than they were before. And the Justice Department in the letter of December 15th uh, makes a point, and they make it as a secondary point, but I think it's incredibly important. And that is that the sheriff's raids and his action and his treatment of Latinos has raised a wall of, how do they put it exactly, a wall of distrust between the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office and the Maricopa County's Latino residents. And basically what we said in this brief was from the point of view of law enforcement, that's exactly what these procedures have done. We didn't use the word wall of distrust, but we talked about the devastating impact that these procedures have had on the necessary rapport, the necessary confidence that a community, especially an immigrant community, has to have to be part of the law enforcement solution. And we have profited. Phil Gordon said, among other things, that in his tenure as mayor, Phoenix reached uh, its lowest point of violent crime in history, or in, well, certainly since I was mayor. Um, <laughs> it was a smaller city then. <laughs> We've had remarkable success, we'll put that aside. Um, in terms of dealing with crime, especially violent crime, and finding ways to prevent it, to keep it from happening, and, and, and to find it and root it out when it does happen. And the main way that that has happened is through confidence of the community. The law enforcement community is not big enough. They cannot possibly cover every street corner. They cannot possibly protect every family. And so the bottom line is it's up to us. That's no revelation, we've known it for a long time. But it's up to us as citizens to call in reports, to report suspicious activity, and when the trials happen to testify. And unfortunately, because of policies that have been followed by the sheriff and by others who have seen the, it's not the opposite, they've driven a wall between, especially the Latino community, the immigrant community, and law enforcement. And that made us all less safe. Now we make other points uh, that, that, that come off of that, the micromanaging of the police that is an essential part of Senate Bill 1070, which caused George Gascon and others to say, in the law enforcement community across this country, this is just bad policy. We have had no previous incident where the legislature tried to tell the beat cop exactly what they were supposed to do, uh, which crimes they were supposed to investigate. In this case, a misdemeanor above a felony. Doesn't make sense, but that's what they said. And the last part is expense. Uh, the, the kind of municipal budgets and state budgets that we have to deal with right now um, are strapped at every, every possible turn. And what these policies only have to do is look at the cost of some of the, the, the sweeps that the sheriff has been engaged in. These are very expensive activity. And what did they get at the end of the day? Uh, one or two arrests for misdemeanor offenses. Uh, that's not a good use of law enforcement dollars. I know Supervisor Wilcox can testify to uh, some of the problems that Maricopa County has to deal with in terms of balancing their budget. Uh, you certainly don't need this, and you don't need the liability cases that constantly are being paid out from the sheriff's office. But I think the, uh, the important thing about tonight, and hopefully going forward, is let's talk about the facts. What makes Maricopa County safer? What makes us a community that trusts each other? What makes law enforcement work better? And unfortunately, we've had activities that have gone in exactly the opposite direction. Uh, the symbols go much further than that, and I know you know that, and I won't belabor it, uh, but the, some of the nonsense about border security uh, involves uh, building a fence, for example, mobilizing the military. I heard somebody say that what we really needed was to pull all the troops back from Afghanistan uh, now and just station them shoulder to shoulder. <laughs> uh, and a guy named Jim Colby was the one who I saw in a film recently, stood up and said, you've got to be crazy. There's no way that that will stop the cartels. They'll go over, they'll go under, they'll go around, they'll find some other way to get people into the country, and he's right. Uh, so we have got to stop on the border talking in terms of symbols and start talking about reality. Uh, my personal feeling is we need to stop the flow of money, and that will do more uh, to make our border safe than any other thing you can do, and our country has failed to do that. Um, 
Let, let me close with, with one other thought, and it has to do with Paul Charlton's uh, excellent summation of what the justice system has to contribute to this discussion. Um, I'm frustrated. I think probably everybody here has had their share of frustration about how exactly long this process has taken and how long a community has to endure uh, some of the charges, some of the points that were made so convincingly in the Justice Department letter back in December. Um, Phil noted that the original letter was written four years ago, that you helped to start this uh, investigation, which is now apparently grinding along. Uh, for a long time, we weren't sure there was an investigation, but, but now we know that there was. Um, it actually goes back further than that. I know Rick and I met with some of the federal officials uh, significantly before that time to so say we were really concerned on behalf of parts of our community that these procedures were causing incredible damage and that there may be civil rights problems and appropriate when we thought there were. Um, there's a saying, of course, that justice delayed is justice denied. And we're getting to the point where the denied part is becoming extremely, extremely important. Um, and, and I don't get it. Uh, reading the Paris letter, uh, just to quote for a minute, we find reasonable clause to believe that MCSO engages in a pattern or practice of unconstitutional policing. Specifically, we find the MCSO through the actions of its deputy, supervisory staff, command staff, engaged in racial profiling of Latinos, unlawfully stops, detains, and arrests Latinos, and unlawfully retaliates against individuals who complain about or criticize MCSO's policies or practice. I don't know about you, but I think that should have been the first paragraph of a complaint in court, not a letter that was sent to the show. Maybe, as Paul has said, we're at that point now. But look what happened in the meantime. They gave 60 days to talk. I don't know where they've been in the Justice Department of the United States, but anybody who's dealt with the sheriff knows that he's sly like a fox. He'll take that 60 days. He will use every day of it, and he has. In this case, to examine the birth certificate of the President of the United States. <laughs> which is a masterful piece of changing the subject. And now, whatever happens, he will say it was retaliation because I had the courage to stand up and investigate the president himself. So, to some extent, that 60 days, granted by the Justice Department, apparently thinking that they were being fair, um, is going to turn around, I believe, and hurt the case. And so even if they come to court tomorrow, I sort of hope they would do it today, but they just did not. Uh, the bottom line is that he, as he is so good at doing, let's give him all the due that he is entitled to, and that is he's a master of manipulation of the public word. He is somebody who has been able to use the theater of public discussion to his advantage incredibly well, and here's one more time that he has done it. So let's continue the thoughts of, of, of today. I, I, I've spoken too soon, perhaps, because I've said that the first three speakers talked calmly and without emotion and didn't beat the table. Rick Romney's next, and he may do that. <laughs> so he has a chance to show that I'm wrong. But thank you very much for participating. about how slow this process has been, but in reviewing the Department of Justice report and what some people may not know was that in 1995, the DOJ determined that the MCSO jails violated inmates' constitutional rights through excessive force and deliberate indifference to inmates' serious medical needs. An agreement was reached in 1997. This sounds very similar to what is in this current report that came out in 2011. Was there, do you, do you know, was there any follow-up? What, what happens after they've been sanctioned? Is it just you get sanctioned and then you're done? 
Well, you're supposed to change. Uh, and, and actually, your next speaker uh, was, was involved, I believe, to some degree in the Imaging that Agreement and, and can, can deal with it uh, more convincingly. But I, I, I guess my basic question is, how often is it, how long does it take to make a point? How many reports does it take to make the case? And how long do you have to work with somebody who you know? It, it, I, I, was, I was mentioning somebody earlier today, and I, I absolutely believe it, that back in December, all of us who watched the sheriff through his career, and I think that's everybody in this room, knew that he wasn't going to agree to a month. We knew that. They should have asked us. <laughs> Finally, we have Rick Romley. Rick has served four elected terms as Maricopa County Attorney from 1989 to 2004 and was appointed as Interim Maricopa County Attorney on April 16, 2010. He was responsible for administering one of the largest attorney's offices in the nation and was responsible for the civil representation of all county government. Rick has testified before the United States Senate and the U.S. House of Representatives on issues of violent crime, terrorism, drug trafficking, youth violence, public corruption, and victims' rights. For these efforts, Rick has been the recipient of over 100 awards including the National Leadership Award presented in Washington, D.C. in 1997. Rick joined the United States Marine Corps as a youth and served as a combat, combat infantry squad leader in Vietnam until he was wounded in 1969. Rick received numerous commendations, including the Purple Heart. In 2001, Rick received two additional national awards for his service in defense of our country. Life's Presidential Unsung Hero Award, and America's Outstanding Disabled American Veteran of the Year. Mr. Romley was inducted into the Arizona Veterans Hall of Fame in 2007, the highest honor that can be bestowed upon a veteran in Arizona. Continuing a 100-year Arizona family tradition, Rick and his wife Carol live in Scottsdale, Arizona. They have three sons, Darren, David, and Aaron. Welcome, Rick. what we really are and what our values 
you know, are to be. And civil rights is there. And civil rights truly does define us. It talks about the values of our Constitution, that we are to be treated equally under the law. And those values are so worth fighting. You know, as, they, uh, as, as pointed out, I served in Vietnam. And I had the honor of serving with many individuals that fought for those ideals of our nation as our veterans of today do. And many gave their lives. And I say to the Department of Justice, I don't know if we have any representatives here or the FBI here, but I say to them that they are on the front line as well. That what they do in their next steps are as valuable to ensuring that our ideals and our values are upheld as a combat veteran in Iraq or Afghanistan. This report was so outrageous that it requires the Department of Justice to do something. So I'm going to give you my recommendations first, and then I'll back up a little bit. I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> And my recommendations have been echoed by my colleagues up here. Uh, the Department of Justice must act quickly. They are truly losing credibility. Can you hear me now? Yeah. You know, the longer that it takes for them to conduct a thorough investigation and to act appropriately, that they are losing credibility, as Terry Goddard pointed out. Joe Arpaio is masterful at manipulating the media in such a way that we begin to lose sight about what the report was about. Rather, it's political. Rather, as Terry says, I've gone after the president and it's retaliation by the Democrats. I know this for a fact because that's what he did for me when I was county attorney. Remember Scott Norberg? Yeah. Scott Norberg was an inmate that had been arrested for disorderly conduct and it was found that he had drugs within his system. And he was killed inside the jail. And I'll never forget that during that investigation, Joe Arpaio stood up and he says, I've seen that body. There was no bruising, there was no marks on that individual. My deputies did nothing wrong. Well, I too had at least seen the photographs and read the autopsy reports of Scott Norberg. He had been stunned dozens of times. His larynx was fractured. He was, he was literally suffocated and died. We had a jail detention officer that had come to me. This is not too public anymore, but it is a closed matter. And it told me that she told the guard to quit, you know, quit the, the, the suffocation of him in the restraint chair. He was pushing his head downwards fictional suffocation. He's turning blue. And the guard says, I don't give an F. Right then I knew that we had a very serious problem. The reports within the coming out of the Maricopa County Jail were extraordinary. The lawsuits were growing. The settlements that we had to pay and the Department of Justice did an investigation and found that there was excessive force within the jail. And in that report, they gave examples as well. And I, and I apologize to the young individuals here. But allegations of stunning inmates' testicles 
to STEM dance. Public reports. And what did we as a community do? Nothing. Nothing. An agreement was entered into it. I was not the attorney, by the way, Terry. I, because I was investigating Scott Norberg at the time I hired outside counsel. And an agreement was reached to change the practices within the, the, within the jail system itself. And a year later, after the signing of that agreement, we were having abuses again. And once again, inmates were dying. Women were having miscarriages because of improper health practices. There was inmate upon inmate violence, altercations as well. That is why I come to the recommendation that not only must the Department of Justice act and act quickly, but there's no more negotiations. No more negotiations. This is a tactic by the <laughs> pointed out there's two values to this and Paul I think said it very well it is time that the public become aware of the specifics of the allegations that are out there and only with that transparency will we as a nation as a community perhaps begin to stand up and say this is not acceptable it is not acceptable at all. That transparency, regardless of the cost, and I say to the Obama administration, I know it will be expensive, and I know to Maricopa County, the Board of Supervisors, it will be expensive. Regardless of the cost, it is better to go to court, to stop the lies that continue to come out of the Sheriff's Office, and now the County Attorney's Office. <laughs> that if there is a finding that there are these violations that have occurred, we shall have judicial oversight. No independent monitor here that I trust you. He will fight that monitor and claim that that monitor is acting improperly. And you know what? We'll have to go back to court again. Let's get it over with the citizens of Arizona deserve finality to this nightmare that we have been having for over 15 years now. Yes. Over 15 years. It must stop. So I ask the Department of Justice to go to court. We're lawyers. We know where it's at. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's time. Because it's something more important. We are talking about those inherent values that we cherish so much. That we are a nation of laws. That we are all equal. 